Welcome to episode 8 in the KIPPS Personal Training Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of KIPPS and Kettlebell Concepts. In this episode, we're going to be answering the question, what do you do after you become a certified personal trainer? In this episode, we have guest Vincent Mezzo. He is the Dean of Personal Training at the Swedish Institute in New York City. And also, he's the Director of Education for Kettlebell Concepts. Let's not waste any time and let's get to the episode. Vince, having helped thousands of individuals become personal trainers, what are the characteristics that you believe help them acclimate into the fitness industry? Well, the fitness industry and education and being a personal trainer are kind of two different things, right? So you've got somebody who can work very well with an individual as a personal training client uh, in their home, in a one-on-one setting, in a corporate fitness setting. But when you put them into the quote-unquote fitness industry, there's a whole other level of expectation and basically sales literacy that is suddenly required of them. Now, to be successful in any position, you need to have soft skills. You need to be personable. You need to not alienate people. You need to have read Dale Carnegie's How to Make Friends and Influence People. But in particular, if you're working in the fitness industry in a commercial club, a lot of times personality and having the gift of gab and being able to engage people and having that extroverted personality is the thing that is going to help you succeed, at least in the short term, more so than your actual knowledge of fitness or ability to train. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've personally seen that. I've told my interns in the past how when I first started in the industry, I worked on a staff, I think it was 35 to 40 trainers. And being in school, of course, I had an appreciation for education and what that does for your career. But at the same time, you see other people on your staff that they don't have that same type of education, but they are rocking it as personal Mm -hmm. trainers. They have certifications, of course, but they have that, like you said, that it factor, that personality factor that comes through that allows them to make conversation easily, be able to talk about, I'll say sales and which is a hard topic in my opinion, but allows them to just do it easily. Make them makes the customer, the potential client just feel a lot more comfortable. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I think that also brings up the question of the whole experience versus education. I feel like that one comes up a, a lot with Whenever the whole licensure conversation comes up for personal trainers, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, what is he talking about? Is, is, it, is personal training become licensed? That has been a debate since when I was in college that, and I'm not going to try and age myself here, but it's around <laughs> roughly 10 years ago that it comes up. And I remember even back then they were talking about it might happen. It might happen this next year. Or they're, they're starting in certain states that personal trainers are going to be required to have a license, but it hasn't happened yet. But at the same time, what happens to all those trainers that didn't go to school? Or are they going to be grandfathered in? Or are they going to be required to take another exam? So with talking about experience versus education, where do you kind of lie in that debate? It's, it's a big question. And... There's in a perfect world, and then there's pragmatically what is going on in our current atmosphere uh, in our society in this country now. So generally speaking, I think that the story of the blind men and the elephant is a really great story. You have a a number of different cultures that have used this story. And basically the idea is that some learned person asks these four or five blind men, tell me the truth of an elephant. 
And one blind man is at the leg of the elephant and he feels the leg of the elephant and he says, oh, the elephant is like a tree. And another blind man is by the body of the elephant and he touches the body of the elephant. He's like, well, the elephant is like a mountain. And somebody's by the trunk of the elephant and touches the trunk. Oh, an elephant is like a snake. So because they're only seeing part of the picture, they don't know the truth of the elephant. And ideally, what education should do is education should give somebody the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And when somebody only learns from experience, they are limited in what their picture is. They are limited in what or how they are viewing things. Well, in my experience, yeah, but you've only ever worked with people who are 20 years old, who are in your town, who are all white, who all do this kind of job, who all whatever, 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 your experience is limited and therefore your knowledge is limited. And that's the danger of experience. That's why we moved from working as apprentices and journeymen and going through that type of training to education where you get this framework and then you can figure out how to adapt to different situations. You know, the unexamined life is not worth living, but the unlived life is not worth examining. So I also, having come through conservatory programs, both in high school as a fine artist and also in my undergraduate work as a theater major, you know, why am I going to school to become an actor? Right? Why am I taking theater history? Why, why does that matter? If I really want to be an actor, maybe I should just go and make plays. So there's also, you know, I can also see the so, that side of the story in that, well, if you want to do it, you don't just want to talk about doing it, you actually want to do it. And what happens in a lot of personal trainer education at the accredited college level is you get all of these didactic classes and they're great, but then basically they send you to an internship to fill in most of your hands-on skills and so ultimately your education becomes limited because, well, I interned at Crunch or I interned at a physical therapy office or I interned with the athletic trainers at a you know D3 school and I worked with D3 athletes. So even though you have all this knowledge, then your practical application becomes limited. So I think we need a combination Mm -hmm. of both experiential and classroom learning, but that experiential learning needs to be in different places. So there are all sorts of trainers who work in commercial fitness, and if you ask them to do a submaximal bike test or to take somebody's exercise heart rate and blood pressure or to do load calculations or to do ACSM's metabolic equations, they would have no idea how to do that. And yet they go to a continuing ed course and they learn about the FMS uh, methodology or the FMS tests. And suddenly they think that, oh, well, this, this is everything, right? If you don't have a score of 21 or your score is 14, or if you get this, we need to stretch this or strengthen that. And they think that's the whole world, but they've never actually seen what else is out there. And because they haven't actually studied science, they haven't looked at the validity, the reliability, the repeatability of those tests. And do those yeah. tests really measure what they're supposed to measure? You know, they, they did a great job marketing, but at the end of the day, can we really say that if you have a score of less than 14, you are more prone to injury or are you, or is it even predictive of injury? 
right? Do we really have those statistics and do you understand what it does and what it doesn't do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the limitation if you just go the continuing, oh, I take every continuing ed course, but what education is that continuing from? What framework do you have to look at those other courses and take from them what's useful, and not just because of where you work, but take from them what's actually valid and is a principle that you can apply to different situations and be able to move aside the fluff and the marketing and not get caught up in that. Yeah. So without a, without not just an education, but without a really good education that taught you how to think, yeah. then it's going to be difficult to do that. Yeah. The foundation that you get from education and it could be a vocational school. It could be a traditional four-year university, community college. That education goes so far. But I think what really, um, I'll say, resonates with me is the whole internship process. Having had interns when I ran my own boot camp, but also being an intern in a university setting, that was something that it wasn't until after I graduated that I really realized what they were trying to do with it. Um, I know my program that I was in at Long Beach State University was different than other programs. We were required to do, I'm trying to think back, I think it was 500 hours of traditional and 500 hours of corporate training. So essentially working at a corporate wellness center and then 500 of working at any type of traditional gym. Um, and there were programs that were set up with the university. And I actually set one of those up after with my business. But during that time, you really get that hands-on that if you want to be a personal trainer, if you want to be a strength trainer, strength and conditioning coach, whatever that might be, hopefully you're taking that time to get hours in that setting. Because not only will you get something that you're going to walk away with, but you're also going to be able to ask yourself, is this something that I want to do? Is this, some, is this the area that I want to specialize in? I think that that is something also to think about for those that are thinking about, do I want to be a strength trainer? Do I want to be a personal trainer? Do I want to work with seniors? Whatever that might be, taking that time to ask yourself, have I had? do I have an experience? Have I really took the time to experience that and you know, think if this is going to be a career path for me? Because I think sometimes we set out wanting to be a physical therapist, want to be a strength coach or athletic trainer, and I'm not going to lie, those latter ones are tough positions to get. There's very few of those. Yeah. And it's And it's they competitive. don't pay as well as you would think they pay. Exactly. Exactly. And some of those individuals become end up becoming personal trainers where the money is good. The hours can be flexible. Mm -hmm. So taking that time to ask yourself, do an internship, if you have that availability, it can be good. The I think the area that I have an issue with, and this is just social media in general, but on Twitter, <laughs> you see lots of strength coaches talking about how they would rather take somebody with experience being a strength coach, rather somebody right out of college and saying that the person with no education, uh, trying to make that point that the education does not make them much, much better. I think that it's, in, it's a case by case scenario. And mm -hmm individuals might have the factors, the personality, the education, and if you get them in the right system, they can flourish. And I think that that is something that a personal trainer, if they get certified, in my opinion, even though I run an education company, I've worked for education, different educational companies, if it doesn't matter what certification you get, because after you get that certification, what you do then is what is going to matter. It's in a matter on your paycheck. It's in a matter what you do after that. Yeah, to some extent, I would also say that if the certification is too easy, it's worthless. So I think there are certifications out there that are so easy to get, and this includes accredited certifications. They're so easy to get that they don't really mean anything. So just saying certification, they even though they may be NOCA accredited, they aren't all created equal. 
And so you can have somebody who got one certification have somebody who got another certification. They're actually starting from very different foundations. And I think that's a problem in the industry also. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, just being certified isn't the same as which organization you're certified by. And the idea that people don't really understand the difference between a certificate and a certification. What what does it mean to have an accredited certification that's based on a job analysis? Mm -hmm. it, that's a, I can speak from experience that that is a whole nother topic that I, and not to throw any organization under the bus or um, you know, well, just notice I didn't, I didn't mention any acronyms <laughs> or names or anything, but yeah, yeah it, it, it should be well life. known out there that what, you know, not all certifications are created equal. And if the certification is too easy, it's pretty much worthless. And getting back to the blind men with the elephant, if you've only taken one certification, you only know one organization and you don't have anything to compare it to, then how do you really know if yeah. that or if that test was really hard or not compared to other tests, if it really measured the knowledge that you need or the breadth of the knowledge, or did it just leave out things altogether because they somehow deemed that they weren't important? Good point. Very good point right there. And, you know, the acronyms of these different organizations or even the difficulty of their exams, I think that, um, the accreditation on top of that, that's something that individuals that might even work for them, I think it's important that they understand what that process is. Just recently, somebody I was talking to mentioned a story about how she was talking about how she's developing this new course. And this person just flat out says, oh, is, is it accredited? And when I was told this story, I was like, does, I don't think this person understands what accreditation is. If they are mm -hmm. talking about a a specialty certification or a continue education course, if their first response is, is it, is it accredited? They don't understand what that process is and even mm -hmm. what certifications are meant to, or which are required to be certified in order to get a certain profession. And I'm not going to say what this, where this person, um, what their background it is, or I won't even say what organization they're coming from, but I will say it is, they're considered one of the top ones. And I think this person was even one of their board of directors and they mm -hmm. don't know the differences. And it's, I will say that I'm one of the few that have done an accredited application for a, a company for two companies. And I've helped with the process. I know what that, how, how it goes and it's difficult. It's a very long process. And I think getting that information out there is important for entry level trainees that hopefully after a certain period, they understand why it's important, but also what it means to have that standard with your certification. But uh, I think to bring this back to what we're talking about today with is the, those next steps, those next steps for a personal trainer. They got this certification. They got that uh, accredited certification. Where do I go next? What am I supposed to do? And I think a good question for you, having helped several trainers, having been a uh, a part or being the director of education for a specialty certification with kettlebell concepts is do you usually do you have a recommendation for an entry level trainer in terms of do should they seek out more experience first or should they go for more education well get it just backtracking a second to the previous question you know experience versus education well, experience versus certification is also a, a big issue because yeah. none of these certifications actually have practical exams. So back in the day when I took ACSM, we went out to Adelphi University to get our HFI, which is now an exercise specialist. And basically, you would go to workshops for a weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday. And then on Sunday, you would take this test and you had a written test as well as a practical test where you had yeah. to do a treadmill or a bike test. You had to take skin fold measurements. You had to show somebody stretches. You had to administer the sit and reach box. 
and you got this whole dot matrix printout about how you did on each component of the practical exam. But obviously it became too uh, time ineffective. It became ineffective to do these weekend seminars and these all day tests where they needed all these practical testers to be able to administer the test. So what most of the organizations did is for this practical component, they went on to videos, watch this video and answer this question, right? And that took the place of a practical component in the test, you know, are they taking blood pressure incorrectly? Are they doing it correctly? What is there anything wrong with this skin fold measurement, how they're positioning the calipers? What about this squat? You know, things like that. So you can have somebody who's certified because they read a book and they're a good test taker, but they're gonna, you know, poke somebody in the eye with the calipers or put the blood pressure cuff around somebody's neck. And they don't actually know what they're doing. And we're not even getting into, you know, how are they coaching, teaching, observing, correcting when somebody does a squat or a clean or swings a kettlebell or does an overhead press or even uses a piece of selectorized equipment. Right? So that, that becomes a whole other unpacking, which is why at the end of the day, and educational experience that provides you both didactic and a hands-on component, including internships, preferably in different types of fitness venues would be optimal. But what do we end up relying on is certification Yep, where you can read a book. And if you are semi-literate, you can pass that certification test and not necessarily know what you're doing. But let's say that you you trained with a trainer for a couple of years and you got interested in this and you were like, hey, this is what I want to spend my life doing. I want to help people go through the same journey that I went through. And I was in business, I was, you know, in advertising, but now I want to do something where I can give back. And so I've trained with this person and I've gotten myself healthy and now I've studied and I've read this book and I've taken this certification. And now I am a certified personal trainer by XYZ organization and I'm ready to start working. Okay. Well, where does personal training fit in our society? I think that before we even think about what course should I take, it's, well, what are, what are we trying to do, right? What, what is our purpose? Why do we exist in this society? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, it's not a question of, well, what gym do you work in? Oh, I want to help people lose weight. That's part of it. But in the bigger picture, are we a physical culture? Are we a sports culture? What does movement mean? And I think those are the things that really people have to examine. And then you go on and you start to think about, well, how can I further what my mission is? And if my mission is to help overweight teenagers, well, then you need to take that training youth and adolescents continuing education course. If you want to help people move better, maybe you need to take more body weight continuing education courses and more kettlebell continuing education courses and things that are more conducive to teaching movement. And by the same token, it also depends on what is your previous background, right? Did you yeah. work in advertising and you've been sitting behind a desk and you were in the chess club in high school and you've never moved? Or were you a semi-professional dancer and you can move well? So maybe, yeah, I could take TRX and kettlebells or suspension training or, you know, all these other things. But you know what? I can pick that up in about two minutes because I'm a dancer. 
I have movement literacy. I have this big movement vocabulary. So actually doing the movements isn't the problem. What I'm interested in is why. And for that person, I would say, well, maybe what you need to do is go get your master's degree now and study motor learning and study exercise physiology and public health and things like that, because the movement part of it is easy for you because you've been moving, right? So what you need is the why, and that's what's going to interest you. So where you go, you know, the other thing when I was in corporate fitness, the more certifications we got, the more we moved up the pay scale. And that happens at a lot of commercial gyms also. So if you get your suspension training and your kettlebell training and you do a prenatal, then you're a tier three trainer. You move up to tier two because, you know, tier three or level three, well, that also has a sales component to it, not just an education component. But if you get more certifications, then you're going to get more per session. So you start to look at, well, what are, you know, what is this particular club that I'm working for, this particular business that I'm working for, what do they value? And that's going to drive what your next goal is. And for some people, it's about not certificates, not continuing education, but getting more certifications like actually accredited certifications. So you've got, you know, ABC, and now you want EFG, and then you want XYZ, and you're collecting these accredited certifications because they focus on slightly different aspects of fitness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's the old, um, if we're talking about individuals and what their next steps are. It's the old fitness. Mm-hmm. It depends depends on the individual, what setting they're in, what, what do they want to accomplish from it? It depends. Everybody comes in to the industry at different steps, different points in their life. And it's really just how you said, asking themselves, what is your goal? Where do you want to be? And how are you going to get to that, that end goal? And to hopefully make a career out of it, make a Absolutely. career that, like, that pays you well. If you're trying to move up the pay scale, there's nothing wrong with that. It's an industry. This is a paycheck. It's right. a it's a profession. Yeah. It's a real profession. And so, absolutely, I, I think that that one brings me to my next question, but also uh, an important one for trainers that are still r- relatively new in terms of what kind of gym if they want to work in a corporate or traditional setting. What kind of gym do they want to work for? I think it's a really important question. I remember when I had interns, I would ask them, okay, what kind of gym do you want to work in? Do you feel comfortable enough selling personal training? If they answer yes, okay, then this brand might be much better for you. If, you, if you're if you okay having those conversations, yeah, you're going to make more money, but you have to have those sales conversations. You have to sell. You have to grind it out. Your hours might be early morning, late at night, because that's when people are available. But if you like that, if you think you can do it, awesome, do it. And on the other hand, I've told trainers, new trainers, that if you if you want to take your time a bit, if you want to learn how to sell, or if you want to, you know, put it off on somebody else, there's a, there's brands out there that they'll do the selling for you. You just do the training and you could get really good experience just training people. You know, you could show up, you clock in, you train person a person for an hour, move on to the next client, next client, next client, next client. Nothing wrong with that too. You can really hone in on your skills. And then when you feel ready to jump to a bigger gym, that's going to pay you more, that's going to require you to sell, do it. There's options for you out there. And I think it just depends well, on- Do you training. find, I mean, that that sounds like you're making the assumption that you make more money if you sell. Uh, I, Is that I'll what say, you were trying to say? Uh, I don't want to say that quite because again, I think it depends on the trainer. And I think that some brands out there, we're talking about traditional corporate or traditional gyms. Uh, if you sell personal training, um, in my experience, they're a little bit higher tier gyms. Um, they require the, the trainer to sell and they pay them more. But at the other end, if you aren't selling and if you don't have clients, you're not going to make money. At the other end, end of the spectrum, if the fitness manager or PT manager, whatever they call it, is doing the selling for you and you're just doing the training, they might pay you less. But if you are solid, if you know what you're doing, you might be 
doing six to eight hours a day of training and you might be making more than the other person that technically has a higher per per hour salary, but they don't have any clients. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, way back in the day, Sports Training Institute, which was, you know, some by some people is credited with creating the modern personal training model and combining personal training with physical therapy in order to provide this very high level of service. They were a standalone gym that basically you couldn't just become a member, you bought personal training, right? So you joined that gym to get personal training. So the personal trainers weren't selling training within a place that sold memberships. The membership was a personal training membership. And we're seeing more and more in the industry that people are realizing you know, these big box gyms, you're renting space and people come and say, oh, I, I don't need training, right? And you'd never hear that in a martial arts dojo. Somebody come and say, no, it's okay, sensei. My brother was a black belt. I just want to hit your heavy bag. But people come into these commercial gyms and they're like, no, I don't need help. I just want to use the weights, right? Do you have the 50 pound dumbbells? Oh, yeah, I'm good. I don't, I don't need a trainer. And there are a lot of business owners who are saying, you know what, we need to actually get people to appreciate that this is a journey and an education and that if you really want to get results, you need to sign up for the whole thing and you need to get the proper instruction to use this equipment and have a program, not just come in and work out. Mm -hmm. And so you join to get training. And yeah, you can come in and use the treadmill in the way your trainer prescribed, but when you're actually going to do your weights, you're with the trainer, hmm. right? And that's a much higher level of service now. Yeah. You know, and that's sort of the reaction of these boutique gyms against the, what some people would call the big box gyms yeah, right? that are just mainly membership as opposed to a specific product. Yeah. Right. And then they're also teaching one methodology, you know, yeah. so if you come to this gym, you are getting this methodology. This is what we believe. This is how we train as opposed to going to a big box gym where all the personal trainers are trying to sell and compete with each other. And this one saying, oh, yeah, you should always do this. Oh, yeah, you should only eat that. Oh, no. Yeah. And they're all contradicting each other. And then we wonder why, you know, the industry doesn't have the credibility that we would like it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, very good points and good insight into the offerings out there and even introducing into the this episode about the whole boutique fitness and how they separate themselves and they're including their methodologies into their, essentially their marketing to attract members uh, because it, those are big things right now, boutique fitness mm -hmm. and cutting into big box gyms uh, with their different styles and what they're offering, their pricing, all that stuff is different, but the, it's options. If you're a personal trainer looking for a job, uh, it's another option for you that you can absolutely learn about it. If that sounds like, okay, that really interests me. I think that I could fit into that model. And that's something that I feel like uh, could be something I could do for an extended period of time. Take a shot, see if it works with you, see what you learn from it. Um, a conversation that you and I had recently that I think is really interesting in terms of what somebody can get out from working for a bigger box gym is their onboarding process. This is something that not every gym chain has, not every brand has, but some of them really have an extensive onboarding process that allows the entry-level trainer or it could be an experienced trainer to come in, learn that system, and essentially walk away with more education. Um, can you kind of expand on that conversation we had and talk about um, the different brands and what you know about that process? Sure. I mean, I don't want to specifically call out any certain brands by name, mm -hmm. but in New York, we have 
trained students at the Swedish Institute in our advanced personal training program who have gone on to work for New York Sports Club, New York Health and Racquet Club, Crunch, Equinox, Lifetime Fitness, Sports Club LA, Reebok, all of these different commercial gym chains. And to some extent, there is a difference in how much education and support the different gym chains give and to their incoming trainers in terms of their onboarding process and their continuing education process. And it very much goes along with, is in step with, the price of membership. So yeah. the lower the price of membership, the less support there is for incoming personal trainers, for employees. And the higher the price of membership, the more support there is for the incoming employees and personal trainers. Now, having said that, within that, some gyms make a point of saying, we want to make sure that all of our trainers are on the same page. So if you ask Joe, or you ask Melanie, or you ask Sarah, or you ask Jeff the same question, you're going to get basically the same answer from any of them. So regardless of whether Joe has a master's degree and Melanie just got her accredited certification and has been doing this for three months, we're going to put all of you through a training that's more than just sales training, but that actually covers all of the basics, all of the basic principles of fitness and how we're going to apply them in this situation. We're going to expect you to not just do workouts, but to actually program for your clients and program in advance and upload that to a Google Drive so that your fitness manager can look at them and make sure that you actually have a plan for each one of these clients. So some places will go that route. In other places, their onboarding is mainly just, this is how you sell. This is how you work the floor. Don't go up to somebody and say, yo, dude, let me show you a better way to do that. You're doing that wrong, right? You should go up and say, would you like a way to maximize that exercise? That's a really great exercise, right? So beyond just starting, <laughs> beyond icebreakers and sales lines, some places will give you more of an education. This is how we want you to do things. So it, it very much depends on where you're going to go work. And mm -hmm. I think that goes step in step with the price of membership. Now, having said that, these are multi-site gyms, right? They have yeah. 50, 100, 150 locations some across the country, some worldwide, maybe some just in, you know, the Northeast or the, you know, East Coast or the West Coast. So within that, once you look at, you know, the, the corporate culture as a whole, one of the things I've heard the most from my students is they're happy when they have a good manager. Yeah. And if we're dealing with corporations, there's that old principle called the Peter Principle. And if you're not familiar, the Peter Principle is that basically you get promoted to the level of your own incompetence. So what that means is, hey, you're a good trainer. You sold a lot. Let's make you personal training manager. Okay, you're a good personal training manager. Let's make you fitness manager. So basically you keep on going to general manager, to regional manager, et cetera. Right? But they stop promoting you when you're no longer effective. 
Mm. So basically, the people who have been promoted, it, according to the Peter Principle, the people who have been promoted to a certain level, and then they're still at that level, what that's telling you is that they weren't good enough at that job to be promoted to the next job. So basically, they're not good at what they do, <laughs> right? If they've been there a long time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that that's unfortunate because you would hope that if somebody was there for a long time, they would be really good at what they do. Now, you know, that may or may not be true. The pre- Peter Principle, you can Google it. it. It's a thing, right? It exists maybe more so in some corporate cultures than in others. But at the end of the day, your fitness manager, your personal training manager, if they don't like you or they don't want to be bothered with you or they don't have the time. It doesn't really matter about the corporation. They're just not going to support you and you're not going to do well. If you don't jive with them, then it might not be the best experience for you. Now you could be working for the same chain, the same company, but at a different gym And if you're with somebody who supports you and really takes an interest in making all the players on their team look good, as opposed to being the brightest bulb in the chandelier, then you're going to do better. So I I think at the micro level and probably the macro level, the gym you choose, yeah, that's important. But the people you work with, the people who are in your direct team, your squad, your battalion, right? That is really the most important thing. You can get the best job at the best gym that charges the highest membership. But if your manager and you don't get along, if you don't get along with your team, if it doesn't feel like a team, then that that isn't going to work out so well. Yeah, it's a good point. And I will say to this day that I'm still in conversation with a fitness manager from when I was just starting off, just from admiring what he did, how he acted, his managerial skills, but also the education that he would give the staff was just top notch. And I will say that that went a long way and had an impact on me. And he actually worked with a different chain that I will mention right now that I think does a really great job. That is Equinox. Um, I've done quite a bit of work with Equinox in terms of their trainers them coming to certifications. And don't get me wrong, I want to work with every brand out there. If you work for a different brand, Lifetime, whatever that is, of course, I want to work with that brand. But I've seen trainers that come from their program and they do really well. They'll go, they learn quite a bit of knowledge and they can take that information and grow within the company or they can take it and leave and probably do just as well. I think that they have a great onboarding system from what I've seen. I've never worked for Equinox. Um, I've always worked for competitors, but that's just my opinion on that. And I've only heard nothing but positive things from that onboarding process. And I'm sure other brands, just how you said, based on the membership price, they have similar onboarding process or some type of educational process that gets them into their how they want trainers to train, the protocol and all that kind of good stuff. Absolutely. So as we get to the end of the podcast here. Uh, Something that I thought would be great is just, again, based off of all the trainers you've helped, all the people that you've taken through your programs, whether it's at the Swedish Institute, Kettlebell Concepts, or the other certifications that you do, what is some advice you think that uh, would be really helpful for someone that wants to be a personal trainer after they get their certification? What do they do next? You got to start working. You got to run it up the flagpole and see who salutes it. And that's, you know, after certification, that's what you got to do. There are, you might have to look around to find the place that speaks to you. And I guess the other thing is you got to be true to yourself. You know, you got to know who you are ultimately and why you're doing this? What's your why? If you're just waiting for your name to come up on the fire department list, then I don't know why you're here, right? That that's not Mm -hmm. the trainer I want. 
And if you're just doing it to make money and look good, that's this probably isn't the best profession for you because you're probably going to have to work. You know, there are only so many Jillian Michaels and stuff. And I'm not even saying that she's a good trainer. I'm saying that, you know, fitness celebrity, that's pretty far off. Working with famous athletes. Yeah, well, if you went to high school with them and he's going to hire you because he's got, you know, $60 million five-year contract, well, that's great. But those jobs are far between. So who is it you really want to help? Why are you really doing this? And if you know that, then you want to be true to yourself and you want to find a place where you can live that right, where you can manifest that. And that might be working for yourself. That might be working at a gym, that working at a commercial gym, working for somebody else might be a stepping stone on your way to working for yourself. So I I think the main thing is where does this fit in our society and where do you fit in our society? What is your goal? What is your mission? And yeah, the medium is personal training, right? The niche is fitness, but where are you within that? And that's what you've got to figure out. Personal trainer is not just one thing. It's there are lots of different things. There are lots of different niches and you want to need to find out where you fit. Good advice. Very good advice. So before we end the podcast, Vince, Can you tell people where they can find you and any upcoming certifications you have? Sure. We're doing a kettlebell level one certification in Cleveland, Ohio, coming up in April. You can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lowtechhigheffect.com or Vincent Mezzo or Indian Clubs 101, or Kettlebell Boot Camp NYC. And my email is vincentmetso at yahoo.com. And I'm all over Kettlebell Concepts as well. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And just one minor correction, just because I got to, uh, that our Cleveland, Ohio Level 1 workshop is actually on May 23rd and 24th. Um, It's at One to One Fitness in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a level one kettlebell concepts workshop. But other than that, Vince, great to have you on the podcast, sharing your knowledge. How many, you know, like I said, thousands of individuals that you've helped get into the industry, get specialty certifications. It speaks for itself. So again, thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Great to talk to you again.